welcome back AP Calc BC students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School and certainly welcome to our final video uh, for topic 10.14 all about finding Taylor and Maclaurin series. And uh, what we're going to take a look at here in this particular video is a really wonderful example. It's a former AP question, it's a former free response question from back in, I believe, 2016. That's going to tie a lot of the ideas together from 10.14 and a few of the previous topics that lead up to that. And so you're going to get a really good sense of what the final question on the BC Calc exam could potentially look like. Before we take a look at that example, though, I do have a page here in my notes that I want to share with you. If you're a student from Avon, you probably have seen this page. Uh, maybe if you're outside from Avon, uh, maybe you have a teacher that likes to use some of my materials and you have seen this page, or it's likely that you have a textbook that has something kind of similar to this page in it. And basically, this table here lists what we feel to be are the most important series that you're going to encounter throughout Calc 2 or Calc BC. And we aren't saying that you need to memorize each of these. Uh, wow, would that be great? But you can survive without having these memorized. Now, the series that are marked with a heart, right, those are the ones that you would probably encounter the most often on the AP exam. There are only four of them. And these are the ones that I would like for my students to memorize just so that they can cut down on the amount of time that it takes to answer some of these questions. Great place to start would be the three right here in the middle, the e to the x, sine of x, and cosine of x. Not only because they are the three most commonly encountered, they're also three of the more easy ones to memorize. And typically, if a student memorizes the first four terms, the general pattern, they can come up with the general term pretty easily as well. And those three are very unique in that they converge everywhere. So take this for whatever it's worth. I would refer to this page from time to time. Try to get some of this memorization down so that you can feel comfortable with that. But I just want you to all understand if you're going into the AP exam, say the night before, and you don't have these memorized, it's not going to be a deal breaker. You can always develop these from scratch if need be. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our example here. It reads from the 2016 BC operational exam. This is free response question six. The function f has a Taylor series about x equal one that converges to f of x for all x in the interval of convergence. It is known that f of one is one, f prime of one is negative one half, and the nth derivative of f at x equal one is given by a pretty intense derivative formula. The nth derivative of f of 1 is negative 1 to the n times n minus 1 factorial over 2 to the n for n greater than or equal to 2. There are four parts that we're going to address, and we're just going to take them one at a time. First part, write the first four non-zero terms and the general term for the Taylor series for f about x equal 1. This is a very popular type of question that's going to be asked on the AP exam. It's also one that's pretty easy to get the points for. You can just have a very rudimentary understanding about how to develop a Taylor series, and you can typically score every point for this particular part. So let's go ahead and take a look. You might notice that this is similar to some of the other problems that we've been de dealing with as well. So if you remember, the way that we like to develop Taylor series is to organize our information. We would normally find the original function f of x and all of his derivatives. But whenever you're given enough information like this, when the function is centered at 1, you can jump right to evaluating each one of those particular functions. In other words, you can say, oh, well, f of 1 was given to me as 1. And f prime of 1 was given to me as negative 1 half. And then f double prime, well, okay, that wasn't quite given to me evaluated at 1. We're going to have to do a little work here. For instance, we're going to have to plug in 1 for our, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> 2 is going to have to be plugged in for our derivative, our n. n is going to be equal to 2 here. So if you run through this problem here, you would have negative 1 squared 
times 2 minus 1 factorial over 2 to the second. And we can clean that up a little bit. Negative 1 squared is 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. Factorial is still 1. By the time you divide that by 2 squared, you're looking at a positive 1 fourth. We're going to do the same thing for the third derivative. And I believe that we're going to be able to stop here. And the reason, well, I say it's very likely we're going to be able to stop here. And the reason is that we're only obligated to find the first four non-zero terms. And you can see that we've already developed three. And we're well on our way to find the fourth coefficient here, or what will make up part of that fourth coefficient. And as long as f triple prime of 1 isn't 0, we're going to be OK. And I don't think it's going to be 0. So if we go ahead and let n be 3 now, again, you're using the derivative number here, 3, as your n. And we have something now that looks like this. And yes, we can go ahead and simplify this. Negative 1 to the third means we are going to be negative. 2 factorial is going to stay as 2. And then 2 to the third is 8. So 2 over 8 is 1 fourth. And so now we have negative 1 fourth. Now we're pretty much set to address what our first four non-zero terms are going to be. And then we'll move on to the general term. So what I like to have my students do here for the, for the terms is you can really do a lot of different things. If you want to just list A1 and A2 and A3 as the separate terms, that is certainly OK. You can write them down and separate them with commas. That is OK. You can write them down and separate them with plus signs. That is OK. The key thing is as long as you have them on paper accurate. So let's say in our particular instance, I'm going to go ahead and list the terms separated by a plus sign. So my first coefficient is going to start with this value of 1. But technically, that 1 should be divided by 0 factorial, right? Well, that's just going to be 1. And then we would multiply that by x minus 1 to the 0 power. And that's going to stay as our 1. Now, by the time you've watched this video, my hope is that you have a pretty good understanding of the basic building blocks, the general formula for a Taylor series or a Taylor polynomial. If you don't, you can always go back and look at some of the videos from previous topics like 10.11 to get some help. Now, our next term is going to have a negative 1 half to lead things off, but you would be dividing that by 1 factorial because you're now in the first derivative, and then you would multiply that by x minus 1 to the first power. And then we can pretty much see, uh, stop right there because it's about as simplified as we could get. And we move on to the next term. And this is where things get a little tricky because we would take our 1 over 4, but we would have to divide that by 2 factorial. Well, dividing that by 2 factorial is the same as dividing it by 2, which means we could multiply by the reciprocal 1 over 2, and we could end up making it look something like this without really reducing it. I'm going to go ahead and put the factorial in there just for emphasis. After it, I follow up with my x minus 1 squared. I have three of my four terms. I'm well on my way to finding the, le the last one which is going to start with a minus. And then I know that I have a minus 1 over 4, but I'm going to have to have him be joined with a 3 factorial because that would have been that denominator at that particular stage. And then I have x minus 1 to the third. And at this point, you would have earned all of the points for the first non-zero terms of this particular series. You don't have to simplify this any more from here. Uh, however, obviously, you know, if we were to simplify, that would be accepted. Just don't make a mistake in doing that because that would be a travesty as you would be uh, not earning that final point. Uh, 1 over 4 times 3 factorial turns out to be 1 over 24, 1 over 4 times 6. So that's your most simplified version. Now, we're not quite done yet because we have to come up with what's called the general term. Sometimes we might refer to that, say, as the 
nth term. It has a lot of different names to it. You can continue to do what I've done. In other words, if you want to continue to say plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plus, and then have this final term be written in that way, that is okay. Again, as I said before, we would certainly accept a situation where a student would list the term, say A1 equal, A2 equal, A3 equal, A4 equal. That would be the four terms that I wrote here. And then you could just put an A in or something like that, and that would uh, be perfectly acceptable as to present your nth term. I'm going to go ahead, like I said, keep it in this whole series idea, though. So what do I've got here? Well, a couple of things I noticed. First of all, I have alternating signs. I want to pick up on that right away so I could use the general alternating uh, notation, uh, negative one, either to the n power or to the n plus one. It depends. Well, if I start positive, perhaps we've known that we're going to use an n power there as many times as we've done this. And the reason is because zero is your n in this case negative 1 to the 0 is positive 1. Later on, when n becomes 1 because of the first derivative, negative 1 to the first is going to be a negative. So that takes care of that. Next up, we have to take a good look at what our formula is once again. Well, again, I'm kind of borrowing from what's up here. I mean, I, why not? That seemed to be the formula that we're going to be using. So it says that this applies only when n is greater than or equal to to 2. Okay, I get that. And so we could jump right to that particular formula if we wanted to. The other idea is if you've already taken the, the, the um, time to reduce, I think it's so powerful just to notice that every single one of these coefficients has a numerator of 1. Here from the 1 to the half to the 1 over 8 to the 1 over 24th. So why not just borrow that? Let's just multiply this by 1 over and then start to look at what we see in the denominator. Well, the denominator seems to consist of a few things here. I, I see a, a 1, a 2, a 4 times 2 factorial, this 4 times 3 factorial. Now that's where things start to get a little bit, maybe a little bit tricky. And again, I don't want to convey the idea that what I'm doing is the best for you. There's so many other ways that a student could break this apart and, and learn how to uh, deduce this particular formula. But my thought is, if I looked back at this 8 and I recognized it, yep, it was 4 times 2. There's no denying that. And if I looked at this 24, and another way to think about how this 24 was obtained might be by saying that this was really an 8 times a 3. Now, I know it was 4 times 3 factorial up here, but that's the same as an 8 times 3. Well, the reason why I think that this is important is because if you look at the 2 here, that's a 2 times 1, we start to come up with an idea. What we come up with is the fact that this denominator seems to consist of powers of 2. 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 to the third. So we could con con uh, uh, convey that as a 2 to the nth power. Now does that still work for this 1? Well it certainly does because this guy over here was really nothing more than a 2 to the 0 power, right, which is 1. And then I'm going to also throw down um, a times 1 after him, which you'll see what role he's going to play here in just a moment. And so to get that original uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, that can be our 2 to the nth power. If you look at the numbers in front, like 1, 1, 2, 3, they may not seem to have a pattern per se, but if you look at it a little bit more in, in the fact that the n is equal to 0 here, and the n is equal to 1 here, and the n is equal to 2 here, we might be a little bit more comfortable in realizing that um, uh, we have something that we can 
right. And what we have can be a little bit tricky here. I'm going to say that what we have in the denominator ultimately may be an n, but originally it's going to act as an n factorial because in the numerator, keep in mind that we had an n minus 1 factorial. Okay, now wait a minute. Where, where did all of that come from? Well, remember, this here is going to serve as the formula to get your nth derivative. In order to turn that into a coefficient, all that one has to do is divide this all by n factorial. And that's really what I'm looking at right here. So if you feel like looking at the term by term comparison to give yourself a chance to write this formula is going to be challenging, let's use what the original problem gave to us. And just so you know, this formula, even though it says that this is only good for n greater than or equal to 2, if you let n be 0 and 1, you will still get these same two values, 1 and negative half. So what that means is we could do some simplifying on this here in just a little bit if we so chose. But we're going to have to finish this up, of course, by multiplying it by x minus 1 to the nth power. And that would certainly work. It is the general term. It's not simplified. But if we wanted to make that happen, um, all that we really could do is reduce this factorial pairing. And I think we would end up with something, oh, like this. I'll put that negative 1 to the n in the numerator. And I have a 2 to the n in the denominator for sure. And then n minus 1 factorial over n factorial is just going to be an n. And I'm not so sure why I wrote that so far over there to the right, because I really don't need that much space, as this is truly going to be that denominator, uh, 2 to the n times n, along with the negative 1 to the n on top, of course. And then, of course, your x minus 1 to the n. And that would suffice as your general term. If you're wondering from the AP exam perspective, how many problems was, or how many points was this part of the problem worth? You might be very surprised to hear that it was worth four points. You actually scored a point for the first two terms. So having both of these correct, either simplified or unsimplified, was worth a point. You got another point for just the third term by itself. That would include that minus sign. You got a fourth, a third point. For just the fourth term being correct, sign included, and then, of course, the final point would be for this particular guy. So there you have it. One basic kind of understanding with Taylor series to get four out of the nine points for this problem. There's only, only five points left for what's uh, remaining, so let's take a look at those next. Part B says the Taylor series for f about x equal 1 has a radius of convergence of 2. They want you to find the interval of convergence. So at this point, what we're going to have to do is understand the radius of convergence of 2 works with where we're centered, which is at 1. So basically, you can think of it like this. If, if 1 is sort of in the middle, think of it like that, and you have a radius of 2 either direction, right? Well, that pretty much means that you're going to be at negative 1 to the left of 1 and positive 3. So your interval is certainly going to be somewhere between negative 1 and positive 3. The only problem is, is that you can't just stop right there and say, boom, that's my answer. However, you would get a point if you do so, because you have the endpoints identified. You then have to go ahead and figure out what's the specific behavior at the endpoints. And that's how you would get the second of the final two points. This one was worth two points that particular year. So we're going to check our endpoints. Now, remember, to check your endpoints, you would plug those in one at a time into your general term for your series. Now, if you remember, we've actually already written that general term. and I can borrow from my work in part A. What we're looking at is the summation as n goes from 1 to infinity 
of negative 1 to the n over 2 to the n times n times x minus 1 to the n. So we're going to go ahead and replace x with our negative 1 and take a look and see what we have here. So upon doing that, we end up with this expression right here. All I'm doing is just erasing my x that I wrote. And I see that negative 1 to the n times negative 2 to the n has some simplifying it can do. Basically, what you can do at this point, if you're not quite certain about what happens, is negative 2 to the n is actually going to be the same as negative 1 to the n times 2 to the n. Okay, You can basically factor out a negative 1 to the n power. Well, whenever negative 1 to the n and negative 1 to the n are multiplied, you end up with positive 1 to the n, which means there is no negative anymore, which there is no alternating term. And so these two things that I'm basically circling here in orange become 1. And so what's left is this 2 to the n that will cancel with this 2 to the n in the bottom. And all that remains is a 1 over n, which hopefully you recognize as the divergent harmonic series. Now, you may not have to write that out per se. All you would have to do is understand that you will not include negative 1 in your interval. Over here for checking 3, we're going to do pretty much the same thing. We're going to replace our n, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, our x value here with 3. And so we still have the negative 1 to the n, of course, over 2 to the n times n. Now if we replace the x with 3, we have this instead. And now we're going to see that negative 1 to the n is going to stick around as an alternating term. Nothing is going to change that. But the 2 to the n that we get here will cancel with the 2 to the n on bottom. And now we have our good friend, the alternating harmonic series, which we know converges. It actually conditionally converges, but all it takes is any kind of convergence to constitute convergence. So for your final answer on this problem, you would say negative 1, strictly less than x, less than or equal to 3, and that would earn the two points for part B. You're already 6 out of the 9 into the problem. Three points left. Let's take a look at what the rest of the parts ask. Now, part C doesn't ask for a whole lot here. It says the Taylor series for f about x equal 1 can be used to represent f of 1.2 as an alternating series. Use the first three non-zero terms of the alternating series to approximate f of 1.2. Well, all they're wanting you to do is to simply plug this 1.2 into your x for the first three. And I think that's part of the issue here is that we only want to use those three series, those three terms of the series. So good notation would look something like this f of 1.2 would technically be approximately, so you want to be really careful there. You don't want to say equals. Um, if you're worried about running into that risk, maybe you don't write this at all, and you just start with the next things that I'm going to put on paper. And if you think back to our answer for part A, it starts as 1, right, minus, and then you have 1 half, and then it was quantity x minus 1. Well, in this case, we're going to replace the x with 1.2. So it's going to look something like that. And then our next term, plus, and in case you forgot, I'm just going to take you back to part A. This would be the term here. And uh, uh, let me actually, let me take you back just a second. <laughs> I uh, kind of forgot something. 1 is our first term, of course. Okay, subtract. And then 1 half, 1 1.2 minus 1 turns out to be this second term still in green. Now we're looking at this blue term and it should be minus 1 8th and then I have the 1.2 minus 1 squared. All right, so here's the 1 8th and the 1.2 minus 1 squared. If you were to stop there, absolutely nothing wrong with it. That would be perfectly fine. It is a little bit tricky to try to reduce this. I don't know if it's honestly worth your time nor your effort. 
Um, I honestly, I wouldn't do it if I was you uh, because you could just simply run the risk of making a, a horrible mistake and not earn the credit for the problem, which unfortunately this problem is only worth one point. So any little mishap sacrifices the credit. But if you were dead set on getting an accurate answer for this, uh, that's simplified all the way down, I would consider calling this 0.215, and the 0.2 squared would be 1 25th. But like I said, that doesn't really make things much easier because you've got to multiply 8 and the 25 together, which, you know, I know it's 200, but um, it, it's really up to you. I, I think we've answered the question with no degree of simplification needed. Um, I do have a decimal answer for this. If you decided to go that route, uh, looking on the AP exam, it was 0 .0, uh, 0 0.905. But again, I just don't foresee too many students going that route, um, especially on this problem that's no calculator. So pretty much any line that I have written here would earn the point. There's your seventh point. One more thing to do for our Eighth and ninth point, part D, show that the approximation found in part C is within 0.001 of the exact value of f of 1.2. Oh, goodness. Error, right? Probably maybe one of the most difficult things that you've learned throughout your Calc BC course. Now, there are two different kinds of errors that you've learned. You've learned about the alternating series error and you've learned about the Lagrange error. You can use typically either one on any given AP question, but it's probably best to use the one that's a little bit easier. And that's typically going to be the alternating series, but you can only use the alternating series error if you truly have an alternating series. Well, guess what? By virtue of this piece right here, we certainly have an alternating series. And I think you guys have probably come to that conclusion throughout the problem by the time you got to part D. And you can also see why part C asked you to stop at three terms so that we could potentially use the fourth term that we wrote in part A. So what is the best way to approach this particular answer? Well, it's only going to be worth a couple of points. You would get an answer from what's called the error form, and you would, of course, get a, a point for the overall analysis. I would encourage all of my students to m memorize the language, the symbolism of the alternating series error, which says this. The actual value of the function, that would be the f evaluated at 1.2, is subtracted from or the is subtracted by the in this case the first three terms which actually is the second degree polynomial p2 i know that's a little confusing because when you see p2 sometimes it's easy to think oh that's two terms that's the second degree polynomial which if i go back here to part a that's actually these first three terms OK, remember that I have in green highlight two terms here because you received a point for having both of those. All right. So what else is true about this? Well, the absolute value of that is always going to be less than or equal to the first neglected term of the sequence. So that would be a an a value, a term in the sequence and the one that we're really focused on here is the third term. And of course, we would disregard any alternating component associated with him, and we would have absolute values in that place. All right, so specifically to this problem, what do we have here? Well, this third term, if you remember, we had already computed it, okay? I can take you back if we need to one last time, but it's this thing here in orange. It's this 1 over 24, x minus 1 to the third. So if we throw him into the mix, 1 over 24, x in this case is our 1.2, all raised to the third. And I guess if you don't include the alternating component, I, I suppose that's OK. But if you recall, this term was negative. Right? It was a negative term back when we were writing that particular sequence out. 
but that really doesn't make any difference because that negative is going to go away because of the absolute values. And what's going to happen is that this is going to end up being 0.2 to the third power over 24. Okay, well, I'm not really sure what 0.2 to the third over 24 is, so maybe I work on that a little bit. And I could think of 0.2 if he was having a dream as being one-fifth. Of course I could do that, one-fifth to the third power. Well, that's the same as putting that five to the third alongside this 24 in the bottom. Okay, well, what is 24 times five to the third power? Well, five to the third is 125, I believe. So if I go ahead and multiply these together just to make sure I end up with something like this. Boy, this brings back great memories of mathematics in the elementary school. And boy, I hope I didn't mess this up because I did kind of do this pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, 24 uh, times 125. I want to double check my work. Uh, nope, I think I did mess up. Let's try this again. You know, let's go slowly this time. 5 times 4 is 0. 20. 4 times 2 is 8. Plus 2 is 10. 4 times 1, so that would be a 5, of course. 2 times 5 is 0. 2 times 2 is 4. Carry the 1 is 5. Okay, now I'm with you guys. This is supposed to be 3,000. That's what I wanted it to say. And so we end up with 1 over 3,000. Well, guess what? 1 over 3,000 is certainly less than 0 0.001, also known as 1 over 1,000. And that would be enough for you to have earned the two points because you've got your structure. Basically, you've got your error form, which kind of consists of this part of your answer. And then your analysis is what leads you through to the end here. Whew. I know, long video, <laughs> one of the longest that we've had. But of course, it's so important that we talk very specifically about question six on the BC exam, because it's a question that oftentimes it intimidates students. Students will look at it and think, I can't score anything on it. But you can find out that there are certain pieces of it, like in part A, that you can certainly earn some credit for. The national average on these problems is very weak, but that's no reason for you to be weak. Set a goal and be better than the national average, which is around three, three point two, three point two, sometimes three points. Anyway, I hope this helps and we'll see you at the next video.